So Urban Heritage Hub uh, is a project that I work on with my colleagues from Street Art Belgrade. We are just a group of enthusiasts. We're also professionals, but this is on, on the level of enthusiasm that where we try to do things um, and organize everything we find on the street so that we can make it available for others. So because we approach graffiti and street art from the point of view that they are urban heritage and that they are going to be heritage of our kids and, and grandchildren. So we want to preserve it the best we can without intervening on the streets, intervening with the people who produce graffiti and street art. And we thought uh, digitization and virtual reality are the best way to do it. And uh, uh, what is important for us is uh, to mostly deal with the things that are done in the streets without permission, because those things that are done with the permission are usually very well documented. And you have all the kind of social networks to, to talk about it, but we want to deal with the, with the other stuff. And also, um, we kind of aim to become a digital institution in the future. Uh, this is long way ahead of us, but we still have these plans because for us, the point is not to really become an institution like Urban Nation in Berlin. We don't want to own anything. We don't want to present anything. We just want to be a place where you can find an info that you need and where things get documented in, in proper way. So Urban Heritage Hub is divided in uh, three parts. The first part is photo archive. The second part is 3D walls. And the third part is uh, virtual exhibitions. So basically whatever we put in the archive, uh, uh, photo archive and 3D walls archive is going to available going to be available for us to do virtual reality exhibitions to kind of make a shortcut, but now we're going to see that shortcut is actually not really short. Uh, okay, this one. Oh. Yep. You worked before, no? Yeah. Let's see. Okay, okay. Now it so, in our organization, we have like two different approaches. So I'm an art historian and my colleague Alexander is a photographer and we both started dealing with the uh, photographs of graffiti and street art pretty early on. Uh, graffiti culture developed in Belgrade in Serbia around 1995. I started my art history studies in 97 and started doing proper research with interviews and photo documentation in 2000. So my archive is basically this, like the old school films that are, some of them are digitized, some of them are not digitized, but basically I have it all in my head. And at a certain point I was thinking that this is really not a good way to you know, have an archive because there are only like two guys in Belgrade that know that I have it. And when they need something, they contact me and then we work with, with what I have. But, and, you know, all other people just can't reach it. And I thought for a very long time that I would actually give my uh, complete collection to the Museum of Contemporary Arts in Belgrade, like photo documentation, digital photo documentation, and my books. But then I realized there is nobody there who can actually interpret these things that I have. Because, like, for example, if you have a Hall of Fame and you document that Hall of Fame constantly throughout years, you know where uh, something was uh, layered over, like something is on top of something else. And I know that because I did photographs, but, you know, people from the museum would not possibly know that. You know, maybe so just the other graffiti writers would know something like this. And then I realized it, it's not going to work. I actually have to find some other way of documenting and actually making these things available for everybody. Uh, on the other hand, uh, well, let's try it like this. Hello. Where am I? Right. No. I don't know what's happening. Well, I would like to see here. Yeah, I have digitization cards. <laughs> it happens to me all the time, and I yet I you know 
prevail. So uh, my colleague Alexander, as I said, he is a photographer and he's been doing photography also since uh, 1990s. Uh, he did street photography in general, but at a certain point he specialized in uh, graffiti and street art. And his uh, archive was immediately available to everyone. So he had an internet site that used to be called Belgrade Graffiti. Then uh, when we merged our two organizations, uh, it became Street Art Belgrade. So you can see here from Instagram and, and uh, Facebook pages how you know it looks. He puts the photograph of uh, photographies on and he also gives the basic info like who's the author if he knows and in which area of the city you can find these things. So you don't get much information. So basically while my archive is like deeply um, like, let's call it academic, but nobody has access to it. His archive was super accessible, but you don't really get any information that you would need for some, some decent sort of research. So we decided we need to organize all of these things and make it uh, look different and make it available in a different manner so that researchers and future researchers would have uh, more information about it. So when we started uh, working on our uh, Urban Heritage Hub project, we got money uh, from the local government just to do one thing. And we decided we're going to do virtual reality exhibition because that was basically a teaser with which then we could apply for, for uh, more uh, budgeting, for more budgets in order to do something like this. But because we had to create an archive uh, on uh, our partners, um, platform, which is We Are All Art, in order to put all of these things inside virtual reality exhibition, we thought, okay, well, this might be a place, good place to start doing our archive. Uh, unfortunately, we were not super happy with it because like uh, this archive was created for uh, officially trained artists. So you had certain categories, but they didn't have categories that I, as a researcher of graffiti and street art needed. And it took me a really long time to negotiate with them to give me a possibility to actually tag the photographs as if you would do it in, in Instagram in order to give more uh, context to the photographs that I was putting there. Uh, there were some good stuff though, uh, like for example, you had a voiceover. So if you didn't really like to, to read that much, you could just listen to certain things, but like the bottom line, it just didn't fit our bill with, we wanted to do something different. So here is my really crooked slide. We tried to fix it beforehand, but it didn't really work out. But terminology and categories, these, these are the really important things for us because these are, you might think of them as like five different information or, or on a particular piece, but they give context and they give meaning to the photo photography that you're looking at. And so uh, you have like the basic stuff here, like t title or the author, or maybe the, the location of the map, legal status and so on and so forth. But also, uh, this is something I really wanted to have. Is it a graffiti wall? Is it new muralism? Is it mural? Because like people just tag it as a mural, but graffiti wall is not mural because there are reasons for that. And it goes back to the culture. And I think it's important because uh, we deal with very particular topics, so I, I wanted to be very precise regarding that. Or, for example, this is one of my favorites, because when I try to talk about um, backgrounds with people from, uh, with our partners, they told me, like, you're nuts, nobody really needs that. But I really need to know, is it on a building, which is, like, concrete? Is it on a freestanding wall? Is it on a train? Is it on a door or is it on some metal surface? Because this determines the way uh, how a graffiti piece or, or a street art actually looks like in their original state. It's not the same if you make it on a, a metal surface or if you do it on an unprepared concrete wall. And this determines the rate of its um, decay. And it also determines the, you know, how the photography is going to look like when you take the photo of, of that particular thing. So for me, that was a must. Everybody else 
that I'm not, but you know, <laughs> I kind of finally get to have my archive <laughs> so I can put this one as well. And um, uh, also, uh, what I also wanted to concentrate on was this part photo and video. So at the moment, we don't have any videos, but we plan to have it. And I think that it's very important to know what kind of photography you're putting on um, on your site or in your archive, because for the future researchers, that's going to be very important because like my photographies, my photographs are analog, the ones from late 1990s and early 2000s. It's not the same thing as when you have a digital photo. We talked about it last year because like early digital cameras have like really low resolution. So you have a lot of materials, but you can't really use it in virtual reality. So, you know, you deal with something that you know it might be working in like 10 years without any problems with AI, but nowadays we can't really use it. Also, it's very important to know, like we have a colleague from Belgrade, he's an architect, but he does, he's also an enthusiast and he does composite photographs of graffiti and street art. So he goes to the same place, like day in, day out, takes like million photos, put them all together and you get this like really out of worldly beautiful photos that uh, enhance everything that is good about that piece surroundings and uh, colors and everything but composite photo is something you're never going to see in in the real life so you really need to acknowledge these things for the future researchers so they know what we're dealing with as well like if you have photoshopped some of your uh photographs which is important because some of them you really do need to photoshop but it's also something that might be useful in the future so this is how uh, our archive looks now. We have um, maybe a dozen artists at the moment. The idea is to have uh, for one artist to have uh, three photographs from different periods of their development. So when you read the text about all of three photos, you can actually understand how this artist has developed and how he styled or her style has developed over the years. And then you get something like that. Uh, so here on the side, you have these categories. Here we don't have all of them because we're still working on some of the, some of the things. Uh, and uh, then you have the text, which tells you something about this particular piece. And I think this uh, is actually for the time a good approach because like when you have more things, like uh, more artists, for example, we plan to have 30 artists times three, times three photos, you will, uh, by reading all of these things, you will get information and maybe some general information about how uh, Belgrade graffiti culture and street art had developed in the last 25 years. So the reason why we are able to actually give so much information about certain uh, artworks, even though they are done without permission, are multiple. First of all, uh, in Serbia, we have laws that exist, but the laws are not enforced. So uh, if you come to Belgrade, uh, you will see that basically everywhere, city center, uh, like all the neighborhoods around Belgrade, everything is full of graffiti, different types of graffiti. So we have a lot of political graffiti. We have a lot of hooligan graffiti. Uh, we, we take photos of all of these things, but we don't really talk about them. They're like good to have as context, but we don't really talk about them. Second reason for, for being able to do something like this is because we try to put the, the borders, like we have borderline, we say we deal only with graffiti culture and street art that came out of graffiti. And we don't deal with any other type of graffiti because as you all know, uh, when you start researching the word graffiti and then you go uh, far, far back into uh, human history, you just get completely uh, sweat with all of this information. You can't really categorize them properly and it becomes just overwhelming to deal with everything. So it's much easier to understand that we're dealing with graffiti culture and what came out of it. And then it's much easier to uh, make the categories 
and to uh, deal with uh, terminology. So uh, this is another slide. So the second thing that we want to have in, in our archive are the walls. So in my opinion, as an art historian, uh, this is the most important part because uh, you don't really want to intervene uh, in, in, uh, in the streets. You don't really want to make people preserve their artworks or uh, make them, you know, restore them or something like that. I, I feel that graffiti culture is ephemeral for the reason, for many reasons, actually, and it should be that way. So we shouldn't really, you know, intervene uh, directly in the streets. But uh, the, the way you least intervene is when you digitize things. So while having this kind of a wall, you can actually walk by it. You can have this experience of um, getting face-to-face uh, -face with these large art pieces and experience them in a different manner than you would normally do with a photograph. But this is becoming really excessively uh, complex because uh, uh, photogrammetry apparently is not a complex process, but storing the data is very, that, that is very heavy and you really need to have platforms for that and you really need to, basically you need to have money for all of it. And because we are the small organization, we sometimes have money, sometimes we don't. Most of the times we basically work for free and this is large endeavor for us. But I think this, if we manage to do it, this will be the most important part of our uh, digital archive because uh, this is uh, what's going to be uh, most important for the younger generations that actually never get got to experience this wall, which is, I don't know, they plan to tear it down at certain points, so you, you won't be able to see it. So when we were preparing recently our second exhibition in virtual reality, we wanted to have this particular piece of art, which was done by Black Lerat in 2009 in Belgrade. He came to Belgrade, did uh, a workshop uh, for stencils and paste-ups, and this art piece is still there, but when we uh, talked uh, with uh, people from, uh, with our partners that, that are uh, kind of keeping all of this digital data for us, uh, we asked them to scan this wall. And you can see in the corner, the whole wall, this is what we wanted. But then they gave us something like this, which in digital world is like a 2D sculpture. And when I put it in the exhibition, I was so sad because it had nothing to do with, you know, the experience that I want to give to people when they enter the virtual reality world and how they can experience these things. Okay, we have now this form, but we decided this is not what we want to do. But this was like the most acceptable for people that are dealing with, um, programming and uh, dealing with photographs. So I, I found that even though we talk about same things and even though we think we understand each other, art historians and artists don't always understand uh, people that are programmers and vice versa. So we thought we understood each other, but we got like product that, that didn't suit us at all. So, uh, I think the most important part with all of these things is to actually manage to form an archive that will allow me as a person who is creating these virtual reality exhibitions, but also the other people as well, to get the biggest number of information, the best context possible, and the biggest amount of photographs that we can actually produce so that when you start doing something, you already have like 50 or 70 percent of materials available to you. So you wouldn't have to start from scratch and do your research from scratch. Like this exhibition, uh, I again had to go through a year and a half of research in order to make it. And I think once we get our digital archive properly done, maybe not finished, but properly done, this will shorten uh, this, this period of preparation significantly. 
and this is our aim as well. So, you know, to give the best possible information you can, because there is no legal consequence, neither for the graffiti writers in Serbia, neither for us that promote the, those things. And uh, it will be uh, much easier to work with all of these things one, once you get it. It's like in museums, you have like this little uh, museological files for each piece that went into museum, you have like the biggest amount of information that you can gather. So this is what we aim at doing. Uh, and I hope that in future we'll be able to actually do it properly. And now, oops. yeah, I'm done. You're done. Yeah. And now we need our the video. video. Yeah. yeah. Perfect timing then. Because uh, these virtual reality exhibitions are becoming larger and larger. So if you should give, you know, to a baby something to play with, it will use it as much as it can. So this is just one segment of the latest exhibition and it looks horrible on the back screen. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but before I uh, finish, I just want to tell you, I have my um, headset here with me. And if you wish, you can look at uh, both of virtual reality exhibitions in some of our breaks. So this is it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Viviana, and uh, open the floor for questions. Please. Yes, Tina. I think I have a very specific question. Um, I saw that um, the data along your uh, interest in the um, testing was free data data. Yeah. Um, and there is one about the legal status. And yes. there you have without permission. And since um, I'm concerned with, or I'm like, well, we there, we have with um, archiving the um, graffiti photographs in the US taking. We're thinking about how to deal with it because asking for permission for uh, like, this is, this is, um, the, the graffiti are in common, right? This is like sucking. And, and we don't want money. Yeah. So how, how are you dealing with this, like, the legal status of the, what, what are the thoughts behind it? So uh, we have quite specific situation in Serbia, uh, as I said, regarding the, the legal issues, because even if something is done without permission, it's not a problem to show it on one hand. Uh, so putting next to it without permission won't change anything. It's just for the future researchers to know that, you know, this was done, you know, somebody just came and did it and they didn't have to ask for any sort of permission. Some of the pieces we have permission by the owners of the building or by the people who live there. Uh, because as I said, we try to document these things without permission most of the time. Uh, but also there are some pieces that are done with the permission, like proper legal status, they get something from the city and then, you know, it's done. Uh, okay, so the, like, this permission thing refers to if the graffiti was done with permission, permission or not. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, but was, you were asking, I like, was asking about, like, graffiti writers themselves. Yes, and if you're taking the photograph. And, and so this is another thing. We've been talking about that last year because in Serbia we had, like, this uh, misunderstanding, like, not EU country, uh, uh opposite eu country and eu laws so basically uh in serbia there is this law that says that everything that is in public space can be photographed and you don't need to ask for any kind of permission yeah. not from the people that are in the photographs not from the art pieces uh, and not even from the people that made these art pieces but uh for for our benefit we uh, know all of the graffiti writers and all of the street artists we work with and they know what we're doing, so we don't have written permission to use their uh, artworks on on our site and in our uh, hub, but they're totally okay with it. Because before I finish each text, I send it to the artist to check it out, to revise it, to tell me if I wrote something wrong or something that that I missed out on. And when I get their permission, I publish the text. So, uh, 
but this is easy because you know i know them all and they are all totally okay with it uh, and the thing with the photographs sometimes we use photographs that are provided by other people or graffiti writers themselves is because we didn't get the proper photograph while the beast was still like new and fresh and we actually really want that particular one so then we uh take the uh, the written permission to use the photo uh, of the author of the photo and then of course we sign it uh in metadata we sign it that you know it's photo provided by this and this person so yeah it doesn't uh it doesn't really always match uh, the way the things are done in European Union. And um, yeah, authors' rights are not organized in the same way. We actually have like really, really good uh, legal uh, protection for the authors' right, but graffiti and street art just go in totally different uh, categories. So, yeah. and, and for those, things you know that uh, the artists are, are okay with it and everything else is also like okay with it. Are you thinking of like stating a license for, for other people that see the page immediately that know, okay, this I can use under the sharing conditions that we thought about? Uh, actually, yes, because there are a lot of people, especially from uh, media that is kind of want to, you know, do some stories about graffiti and street art, and then they say, like, yeah, can you send us some photos? And as I said, photos belong to both me and my colleague Alexander, so we are free to share them. But if somebody wants to, for example, print a t-shirt and uh, ask us for the photo, we normally tell them that this is something that they need to discuss with the artist because it's there art piece and you know it would be really ugly if they reproduce something without their permission so we try to navigate as best as we can but this area is definitely not organized the, the way it should be okay. thank you you're welcome yes. we have time for a very short uh, second question yeah i'm sorry but it's too long so so my question well actually i actually have two but i'll just ask the question about metadata and that was um you did touch upon this so you are using photographs that are given to you by other people sometimes so in in those cases are you able to get the metadata that you want i mean are you always corresponding with that person to find out you know exactly what kind of surface it's on and, and those types exactly for you exactly because I've been doing interviews with graffiti writers since 2000. So I have a large archive of the interviews and I can go back in time, you know, to, to uh, figure out some of the things. Uh, on the other hand, most of the people that uh, used to do graffiti or are doing that now uh, know what I've been doing for such a long time. And they're really happy to share their information with both me and Alexander, so we don't have these kind of issues. So, uh, as I said, before we publish, we always check everything we can with the artists themselves. And sometimes, like, we don't have a certain metadata, even though we have a category, we don't have it. But this is something, uh, it's because we didn't get proper information, or I'm not sure. So, until I get sure, I won't publish something like that.